the beginning, there was darkness over the surface of the sea. In the beginning, there was no sun, no moon, there were no people. In the beginning, there were no animals or plants, only the sea. When there was absolutely nothing, the sea was the mother of everything to come. She was the spirit of what was to come, and she was all thought and memory. is the force that shaped the planet. It is the mother of all life. From the earliest bacteria to the most complex life forms, we have all come from that great marine placenta. And we're all descended from the same ancestral creatures submerged in Earth's first waters. We all share a common genetic code. Water is the lifeblood of the planet. Without water, there can be no life.
This lunar-like landscape, dominated by sun and wind, is the Okukahe Desert on Peru's southern coast. This barren region was once filled with life and the memory of the past remains embedded in the desert floor. This desert offers a chance to fulfill my dream of understanding the past. In Okukahe, the mounds one comes across are not always rock. As you draw closer, you start to see vertebrae, ribs, jawbones, skulls. This is the skeleton of a whale that lived some 10 million years ago. The total length of this animal would have been around 8 meters. It was an ancestor of today's whales. The enormous vertebrae are visible, along with the ribs on both sides of the backbone. It has a long skull with flattened bones and an arc-like jawbone set into the lower part of the cranium. It would have fed by filtering microorganisms from the seas off the coast of Ica. bars you see here, between the upper and lower jaw, were in fact the whale's baleen. They don't have teeth, these whales. What they have is baleen. These baleen are made from keratin, which is a protein. And after, after 12, 10 million years, this baleen is preserved. These exceptional fossilization conditions have made the fossils of Okukahe unique. The Okukahe Desert is the best place in the world to study the evolution of whales and dolphins over the past 40 million years. Every transformation, every stage has been recorded here. How did a whale that lived in the ocean end up in the middle of the desert? The journey to this place began far away, in the lands between India and Africa, 50 million years ago. There, a group of ancient land dwellers return to the sea. In this reintegration with the sea, their organs evolved in a transformation that enabled them to adapt to this new environment. Their bodies became longer, 
their legs were transformed into fins, while their tails developed to become enormously powerful in order to propel them throughout the water. These creatures migrated across the world's oceans, finally reaching the coastline where the deserts of Peru now lie. The mountains of the Andes were produced by the collision of tectonic plates. As the seabed was lifted throughout the length of the continent's Pacific coast, these submerged areas rose to form part of the desert coast, along with the remains of fantastical life forms they had been home to. When I study the fossils scattered across this desert, I think about the origins of life. Because all life originated in the sea. Millions of years ago, our own ancestors inhabited the world seas. The continent's earliest hunter and gatherer inhabitants walked this coastline. Perhaps they sensed long ago, as they listened to the soft breaking of the waves, a renewed bond with the immensity of the ocean. The wonders of that blue world were breathtaking. Nothing we see today can compare with the abundance of life forms in what was still a pristine environment. Those early human groups saw how the sea was connected to rivers, highlands and mountains, and how all waters returned to the sea, creating a cycle an endless flowing life force. The sea was more than a source of food. It was a spirit that engendered all life and it had to be thanked. And so it was that humans built temples along the coast in order to connect with the sea's essence. Temples formed a link between the earthly world and the celestial realm of the gods, as well as the ocean and the subterranean world hidden in its depths. In this case, one can sense the association with something higher in the form of an offering to the sea. As an architect and urban planner, my task is to understand structures and their relationship with their surroundings.
Banduria is a perfect example of architecture's relationship with location. Here, the temple is set on an east-west axis in alignment with the movement of the stars as they appear to be submerged by the sea. In other valleys, there are more temples intimately associated with the sea. According to the chronicler Ciesa de Leon, Cerro Azul was one of the finest Inca structures found anywhere on the Peruvian coast. The temple possessed ramps along which its high priests walked down to the seashore. Today, we don't study history as a way of returning to the past. We study history as a way of interpreting the present and creating the tools of understanding that will enable us to produce a better template for the future. Understanding their relationship with the ocean, ancient peoples built temples to venerate the sea, while also seeking ways to use a natural world they saw as sacred and alive. Across these lands, they planted cotton, to make their woven fishnets. And they genetically modified gourds and calabashes for use as natural floats. They salted and dried the fish that wasn't eaten immediately on terraces built on slopes. The salt was extracted locally. These structures resemble agricultural terraces, but they were created for drying fish. Part of the catch was transported to the Andes, where it was traded for other products. Such was the abundance of the sea's harvest. To sail the sea, ancient fishermen built these first rafts from totora reeds. Similar rafts can be seen to this day. First humans occupied this coast, there have been many changes.
As a land-based species, we experience several limitations when it comes to exploring the ocean's depths. For us, the sea is immense, and it's easy to think that it is inexhaustible, and nothing we do can affect it. I have been conducting research in Peru's seas for more than 20 years, but I'm still surprised by what I find below the surface. Peru's seas are among the most plankton-rich waters on the planet, which is why they appear so murky. This microscopic organism drifts across the world's oceans and forms the basis of the sea's food chain. It is fed upon by many marine creatures, which in their turn are fed on by others. A few meters below the surface, a red cloak begins to form. I watch how these tiny crustaceans advance, suspended in the cold water in a kind of dance. seeing is the squat lobster, one of the many species that feed on plankton. Anchovies also feed on plankton. The spectacle of living color gives an impression of great abundance, but it is an indicator that the anchovy, a species which shares the same food source, is disappearing.
The anchovy has always been one of the most abundant marine species on the planet. But fishing for industrial use has led to a drastic decline in its populations, along with all the species that depend on the anchovy. This situation is aggravated periodically by the El Nino phenomenon. When anchovies flee for their survival from the warm ocean currents, migrating south, or submerging themselves in deeper waters. These birds appear in the sky whenever the big nets are cast, in the hope of snatching a few anchovies from the fishing boats. Flocks of pelicans have difficulty finding enough to eat. The anchovy, their main food source, is scarce. And those that remain have moved to deeper waters. Below the 150 centimeters, the pelicans' heads and beaks can reach. This once majestic species has become a maritime beggar swooping down to pick up what it can from among the catch being taken away from it. The anchovy is not only important to the pelican. It is one of the most invaluable treasures contained in Peru's seas. It is a key species of cold water ecosystems where the majority of species are entirely dependent upon it. These include pelagic fish, seabirds, and marine mammals. To catch anchovies, seabirds must make long flights, sometimes lasting an entire day. But not all marine fauna has this ability. Seals can find themselves swimming for two or three days in search of food. Their expectant pups play under the sun. The survival of the pup will depend upon the mother's success. Now that the anchovy is scarcer and found in more distant and deeper waters, the journey in search of them takes much longer. And the pups are not always able to withstand the weight. When a shell of fish is found, Birds crowd together above it, and Peruvian bobbies appear, diving up to 13 feet below the waters to take their catch. This spectacle has always served to indicate that there are fish in the sea. That is why ancient people used it as a sacred symbol on their buildings. Among the ancient iconography of Peru's northern coast, we find a remarkable illustration of the relationship these societies had with the sea. At the Las Balsas Shrine in Tucume, archaeologists have found extraordinary depictions of marine life. The entire surface of a pyramid is covered with friezes, the subject of which is the sea.
Much more than decoration, these friezes serve to indicate the ritual importance of such structures. Here, we see individuals riding totara reed rafts and using nets with floats. Other men are shown crewing sailboats. Most remarkably, some designs depict men diving beneath the waves, using pointed tools to gather the spondylus mollusks, known in Peru as muyu. These brightly colored tropical mollusks were used as ritual objects and seen as representing the fertilities of the seas. Such was their importance to ancient cultures, they were depicted far beyond the coast by people who lived in the heart of the Andes. As evidence of the important bond ancient people had with the sea, spondylus shells have been found among the grave goods of their dead. transformed into elaborate jewelry intended to assist them on the journey into the afterlife where they would be reborn like the stars. And now, is being paid for the loss of our reciprocal relationship with the sea. The human population continues to grow. The world is currently home to almost 8 billion people. Of Peru's population of 32 million, more than half live on the country's coast. The pace of life is accelerating. Human impact is intensifying.
exploitation of the ocean has reached crisis point. Nature does not tolerate excess. People of the future will certainly be intrigued by the vestiges of our civilization. Hundreds of thousands of years from now, plastic bottles may be more common than fossil remains. We cannot fully understand life on Earth if we limit ourselves to studying the present. Only by looking at the past can we see that life is not limited to the forms we see around us today. The story of life on Earth is a story of change. The story of this planet has borne witness to the evolution of fantastical species that no longer exist but which represent 99% of all species that have inhabited Earth over 35 billion years. By choosing only to look at the present, we limit ourselves to study just 1% of this incredible evolutionary journey. What is the point of thinking about what happened to a cetacean or a shark millions of years ago? Why is it important? The science of paleontology allows me to travel through time and unearth evidence from the past to illustrate the enormous richness of Peru's seas. For millions of years, in the face of catastrophic events that have threatened to wipe out all life on this planet, life has reinvented itself, regenerating over time to produce new species in greater diversity. In essence, life creates more life. Here they come, gliding silently from their feeding grounds in the Antarctic to these warm waters of Peru's northern coast, with one aim, to perform a courtship dance. That ancient rite through which they will create new life. I've been studying humpback whales since 2007, and I've seen how the population has recovered. Mm -hmm. 
They had reached a crisis point on the verge of extinction. When in 1986, Peru signed up to the Global Moratorium on Whaling. Since then, humpback populations have grown steadily. The humpback whale watching season in northern Peru runs from June to November. I go to see and photograph them. Specifically, I photograph the tails, which are like individual fingerprints, distinguishing one whale from another. This is very important, because in this way, we are able to identify each whale in the group, learn more about their migratory routes, and monitor the population. One of the most remarkable aspects of humpback whales is that they are more acrobatic than other whales. Although they weigh 30 tons, they can lift their whole body out of the water. Seeing this immense mammal out of the water is simply spectacular. remember how many times we have followed these same migratory routes. Each journey was different. Each journey has formed part of their evolution as they adapted to the ocean and learned to live in harmony with the environment. That is how they came to be here now but our own population is growing, contaminating the way of life they have regained. I believe that one of the greatest threats to marine species in general is disinformation or disinterest. We cannot conserve what we don't understand. Our life project involves working in both tourism and research, using tourism as a tool for raising awareness and educating people to learn through experience. When we spot whales and dolphins, I can see the passengers' excitement and joy. And I believe that the whales themselves fill us with positive energy. I understand that they are the rulers of the seas. The reproductive males sing. We still don't fully understand how they produce these sounds because they have no vocal cords. But we do know 
that the males emit repeating phrases that we interpret as song. These songs are immensely powerful and can be heard hundreds of kilometers away. It is incredible to hear the songs of humpback whales while diving or swimming in the ocean. Human intrusion in the world's oceans is increasingly evident. Nevertheless, life seeks new ways to flourish. Structures such as oil platforms, sunken vessels, and docks become artificial reefs where life prospers to a remarkable degree. demonstrate how life flourishes when it is given a chance. As a marine biologist, I witness the ways in which life adapts to new environments everywhere. Humankind is able to coexist with all the creatures of the natural world. We can share the same space. Part of the city, life prospers where it's given the chance. This is a wildlife refuge in the middle of a congested city. Around 250 bird species live here, and several other migratory species visit the refuge. Wetlands like these form throughout the entire length of Peru's coast. is a protected natural area within the city of Lima. 
around 21% of Peru's national territory is protected, totaling around 21 million hectares. However, the majority of these areas are situated on dry land. In spite of the richness of Peru's seas, the nation does not possess a single protected area that is entirely aquatic. The coastline is sculpted and transformed by the sea. The landscape we see is merely an extension of the ocean's topography. The diversity found on coastlines reflect the diversity of life forms found in the sea. The rugged volcanic coast of Arequipa possesses bays and deep coves not seen at other points on the Peruvian coast. These places where the waters are calmer than elsewhere are inhabited by fauna which requires such conditions. subaquatic expeditions, I come across new organisms, new species, animals I've never seen before. For example, this species of coral is new to science. It is just one of many species I have discovered in Peru. The taxonomists responsible for describing it have named it hooker coral to honor the work we are doing. But in fact, it is an animal, and also an effective predator. This orange sea anemone is commonly found in cold waters, and it is one of the largest species of anemone in the Peruvian Pacific. It uses its tentacles to catch fish, mollusks, and crustaceans carried toward it by the current. The sea can be a hostile environment with every species struggling to survive. scientific research becomes a great adventure. We can find ourselves descending to enormous depths in search of new species or unknown organisms.
discovered this huge sponge in southern Peru, while in the tropical north we found another species of the same genus. It still doesn't have a scientific name, in spite of the fact that it has a diameter of more than half a meter. Peruvian seas are home to two great ecosystems with completely distinct fauna and flora. One is associated with the cold waters of the Peru current, which dominates most of the coast. The other is found only in the far north of Peru, where warm equatorial currents dominate. Colorful species like these are typical of warm waters, where a much greater abundance of life forms is able to thrive. These warmer waters account for just 5% of Peru's coastal waters. However, they are home to more than 70% of all the marine species recorded in Peru. During one dive, we were excited to find an enormous tube anemone. After comparing it with other species from different parts of the world, we discovered that it was new to science. There is so much still to discover in Peru's seas. In the case of sea slugs alone, we have recorded more than 120 species, of which around 50 are potentially new to science. just touching the surface. Across the world, it is estimated that only 5% of all ocean-dwelling species have been identified. We know more about the Moon and Mars than we do about the sea. As a scientist, my task is to contribute to research, identify what is down there, and then protect it before it disappears. The first people to walk these coasts became the custodians of nature with its birds, fish, flora, and seas. We must understand and value this legacy if we are to revive our ancestral relationship with the sea.
When life is given a chance, it thrives. This small reserve is filled with life because a group of people came together to protect it. This simple act has allowed life to develop in all its rich variety. When we do the same with the sea, protecting its wonders, life will multiply with greater force and marine biodiversity will flourish throughout the world's oceans. In this way, we can create areas of hope During this journey through time, I have learned that it is possible to bring about change. And the moment has come for us to act. We must put a stop to indifference and to the neglect of our seas. It is time for us to reconnect with the sea and to value everything it gives us. will continue to turn, and history will continue for many millions of years to come. The cycle of evolution and extinction means that we will not be around in 50 million years to see the fantastical creatures that will exist then. But the Earth will continue to turn, and its life forms will continue to evolve. Our own bodies are part of nature, and because we are part of nature, when we care for the natural world, 
we are caring for our own species. Our relationship with the sea is vital in every sense. If the sea is to survive, we must all value the bond humans have enjoyed with the planet's oceans since the dawn of history. For humans, the surface of the sea, that thin band dividing earthbound and aquatic worlds, is a difficult barrier to cross. But we are not disconnected from the life of the oceans. All life is one. Continue my song, that silent song, which comes from darkness and spreads into the light. The song that stirs dreams of all living things, of the immensity of time, free of all frontiers and fears. It begins with our mother, the ocean who is spirit, memory, and above all, possibility. <laughs> 